There we go. And Here we are. Okay, we are live on Facebook. I'm going to just double check because I always have to make sure that we are. Um, so I can it's see it. on Facebook group. Uh, we are live on the page. So um, hi, everybody. Um, welcome to um, Retribe uh, Elephant to Castle. What's on it? Elephant Castle Talks. Uh, this week, we are talking to Dr. Misha Jervis of Grinnell University and QPR Youth Academy, uh, and also an advisor to Retribe. Um, and Melissa's over in Toronto. So hi, Melissa. Hello. And, uh, hi, Misha. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Hi, Misha. Hi, hi Melissa. How are you coping with the, with the isolation? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm trying to create a new normal that is <laughs> got lots of good things in it. <laughs> Amazing. Well, um, we've asked you to come on and talk today um, about some of the things that we talked about this week or last week uh, about how the Elf in the Castle community can kind of build strategies and, and, and help cope with, um, uh, with the, the current challenge that's going on right now. But um, Misha, can you kind of just give us a little bit of a rundown, a background of, of, of how you got to where you are right here? Okay, so I'm a sports psychologist, so I've worked pretty much all my life in elite sport um, and was a psychologist before sport even realised that they needed things called psychologists. So I've been around a long time. Um, and I guess my, my experience is that I'm um, both a researcher, so I specialise a lot in understanding psychology of injury and what happens to athletes who are out for a long time injured. Um, but I work um, at the coalface, so to speak, and um, I was the sports psychologist for the women's senior football team in England for about seven years um, and have been involved in football for many, many years. So I kind of work in academies, supporting individual players, working with coaches, working in a multidisciplinary support team. Um, and then also trying to kind of develop the next generation of sports psychologists that come up behind me. Um, and I use um, acceptance commitment therapy as my core kind of psychological framework to deliver our one-to-one -one sessions or even bigger messages. Um, so, yeah. So we're, we're going to try to kind of go into your learnings over or what you've done in the athletic world and see how we can apply it to, you know, the community around Elephantin Castle and people who would be watching this. Um, what would be some of the, the ways that we would start to kind of recognize how people are dealing with this isolation? I think I think what's really important is that in these times, we feel like we have very little control over what's going on. You know, we have no control over what COVID-19 is going to do. We have no control over what decisions our government is going to make that directly impact on our lives. And then if we're constantly bombarded with messages from the media, from, you know, from television and the doom and gloom, and, and it gets very scary and it creates a lot of anxiety. And that anxiety, you know, if we're not careful, we can walk with it and we can feel very threatened and very uncomfortable and um, very disempowered. So, you know, one of the core cool things is, is for us to recognize that, okay, we have to find a little bit of acceptance and go, okay, how do I, how do I make this work for me? How do I create a new normal? And also where are the opportunities? Because there are always opportunities if we, if right. we look for them. Um, and in so doing, maybe there are things that we could do that we've been putting off forever. Um, or maybe there's opportunities to step back and think about what's working in our lives. So it's very, very rare that we are allowed to stop and pause. But it's actually a really, a really lovely thing sometimes. Um, because we're so busy doing and we're so busy right. getting caught up in the now and what we're doing that we don't have time to go, oh, maybe I want to go in a different direction or maybe I could explore this thing that I've been thinking about but have never had the time to do. Right. What would you say to um, folks who maybe you've experienced it but I've noticed I'm experiencing who are who have been afraid of being with their own thoughts or being with the silence um, who seem that that's more of a threat than actually COVID-19 or the current challenge. Do you have any kind of 
strategies or mm -hmm. or ideas around somebody being afraid of what's happening inside their head so let me give you a couple of analogies that maybe might make it easier to understand so i don't know um you canadian folk whether you've heard <laughs> of the game of poo sticks but the game uh, of poo sticks yeah. <laughs> okay, you've heard of poo sticks go on go on okay so the game <laughs> of poo sticks that you play when you're little is that you grab a stick you drop it into a little stream and then you run to the other side of the bridge and you see it come out the other side, right? So the analogy is the stick is like a thought. And normally what happens is a thought will come, but then it will just go down the river. Sometimes what happens is that we drop the stick in, we run to the other side of the bridge, it's not coming out. Where is it? Mm. And that's because it's stuck. So what's happened is that we've attached things to it. So in this instance, we might have a thought that goes, you know, oh my goodness, I just coughed. And then we attach, oh my goodness, have I got the illness? Oh my goodness, I'm going to be sick. Oh my goodness. And we stick things to it. And that's how anxiety works. And then what happens is we grow it and it's not going down the stream anymore. So the technique is to learn to unhook yourself, if you like, from mm -hmm. those thoughts, to allow them to go down the stream. Yeah. And there's um there's a really simple but really useful little technique that um that um, comes from Russ Harris actually, who's an act practitioner, um, a really excellent educator. If, if you if you're looking for interesting things, have check him out because he's worth looking at. Um, an ACE is a technique where there are three steps to it, the A, the C, the E. And first of all, the A is to acknowledge those thoughts and feelings because our automatic minds mm -hmm. throw stuff at us. They just lob stuff at us. So you might kind of say to yourself, oh, I notice I'm having the thought that I've got corona or oh, I notice I'm having the feeling that I'm a bit anxious, I'm a bit scared. And the second that we name and notice it in effect we can create a little bit of space between it mm -hmm. but first of all acknowledging it and just going ah oh, you know cheers for that mind you right. sent me uh, you sent me that thought oh you sent me the covid thought thanks mm -hmm. but then the c is come back into your body you know so maybe you push your feet into the floor maybe stretch maybe notice your breathing but do it with awareness so you come back into your body because when we get caught up in our thoughts, we are no longer present. We, we're getting dragged. Maybe a lot of the anxiety, we're dragged into a scary future. So we need to come back into the present. And then the E is engage in the present. So come back into the now. So it might be notice some things that you can see. So deliberately, I might go, oh, I can see that tree out there. Or, oh, I can see that. So you do it with conscious awareness, notice what you can hear and then think, okay, and now I'm going to carry on doing whatever it is I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And it's a small technique. It takes, you know, maybe 20, 20 seconds to do. And it might be on some days you notice your mind is sending you more automatic thoughts like that. Right. But you might have to do it over and over. And, and also it's important that you think about okay, I was fine, then what happened? So what, what are the triggers for this? Right. You know, and, and how long does it last? What's the timing of it? And once you can understand those, so if you kind of think, okay, I've been watching the news constantly, and then, you know, 10 minutes later, suddenly all of these anxiety feelings are coming up, you right. kind of know what the trigger is. Yeah you found a baseline or like a foundation that's creating those kind of like rapid thoughts. Exactly. Or like, yeah, like nourishing the environment essentially. So the way the environment's creating those negative kind of thoughts, it's our kind of commitment to changing the environment, however difficult and challenging it might be to bring a more nourishing and settling environment really. Yeah. That's and and yeah. you can still live each day with purpose mm -hmm. and meaning. Yeah. You know, and, and kind of go, all right, so in the face of this adversity, what do I want to stand for? Right. What's important to me? You know, and, and, and so when I come out the other side of it, what do I want to say about this time? Mm -hmm. 
how did I use it? I think isn't it's, it, a, sorry, go on, Nick. I see you wanted to talk. Is, isn't it hard when we live in such a self-centric society though, where um, because of not just COVID, but it's like now I'm just fear of COVID, but also fear of not having enough toilet paper, fear of yeah. not getting enough eggs, fear of not getting enough food. And these mm -hmm. kind of, and, and when I went to the grocery store this morning, like they're fully stocked in everything, um, you know, and I'm going once a week and it's all good. So, you know, but my fear last night was, I wonder if they're going to have enough of this. Yeah. And because we live in this world where, where we all, we're thinking about ourselves all the time. What's the, what's the process in terms of, you know, how do we start to transition now that apart from not watching so much news, but where we can start thinking of others instead of ourselves. I think it's about really thinking what you value, what is important. And, and I think that um, most people, when they come out the other side of this, will realize that actually the things that brought them happiness were the small stuff, was the having that conversation with somebody, was, um, I don't know, cooking a meal with a loved one who normally they never have the opportunity to do it. You know, it's the small stuff. So savor, savoring the small stuff and mm. also sharing those experiences with others and, you know, recognizing um, that some people are trying to do this on their own, which does make it extra hard. Mm -hmm. I'm finding too that there's a lot of... Um identity that's being attached and certain narratives that people are letting themselves kind of believe that if I was this way pre-COVID then maybe I can only be that way after and in terms of like the the anxiety or the loneliness and and maybe having this be an opportunity where people can learn new ways of being or or learn new aspects of themselves that yeah. maybe they couldn't really invite or feel safe or protected around engaging in so I don't know if that's something you're kind of noticing as well, or or just maybe talk about, I just, I'm always fascinated with this, but the identities we attach to our stories or our emotions in general. So if I am angry, then, then all of a sudden, I only know myself to be anger and that anger writes the narrative or creates the ripples in the water rather than me being somebody who's experiencing anger or anxiety or loneliness. And, I mean, I think you raise a really important point. And, and the thing is this, is that so much of media and anger, I mean, it, that's what it likes, fear and anger, because that stirs up emotions and it also polarizes people. You know, you right. walk this way, you walk this way. Um, but actually, you know, the emotions, and then we have a flip side because then people are also showing the emotion of compassion you know, and there is a lot of compassion that is being shown. Um, small ways, you know, the eight o'clock for the NHS is, mm. is a small but important sharing of communities, saying thank you, being grateful, showing gratitude, and also being compassionate for one another. Um, so there are those opportunities to maybe explore those sides of ourselves, which maybe normally we're too busy to do because we're just, you know, getting it done, getting right. that day done, you know, doing mm -hmm. all of that stuff, which makes it harder. You, you know how they say there's never any kind of selfless, selfless act. You always get something out of being, you know, being generous or being kind. How does that work? You know, how do like when, cause I know when I clap out my window, I feel good. Yeah, you yeah. don't know if you hear me yeah. cause I, you know, but what is it about, about being compassionate for other people that is a, a direct result inside of me that's making me feel actually useful i think it's the connection yeah because it's it's you can't be compassionate with somebody without empathy and empathy is a really a really powerful feeling that actually when we are being the best versions of ourselves we are able to show empathy um and so much of our world empathy seems to be you know forgotten not present and now you know i mean I, I, it's also really interesting in terms of who we value i mean look who the key workers turned out to be right you know the bin men H how much empathy and compassion and understanding prior to this have the bin men had 
And yet, you know, you walk down the road and people are writing thank you notes to them and mm-hmm. actually valuing them. NHS workers, of course, but that but that is a whole load of people that goes with them, you know, the porters, the cleaners, the all of these people, they're literally keeping us functioning and alive. So I'm hopeful that maybe at the end of this, there is a shift in terms of what society actually values. Right. Um, and hopefully it's not just, you know, chasing, chasing dollar signs. Yeah. Do you want to, are you going to say something? No, you're up. Oh. We're, uh, we're alternating questions. I know, we didn't even do that on purpose, actually. I think there's just so much um, substance here that we can go a thousand different ways. But I think the the idea of, of value and what we've kind of prioritized in our life and kind of what we've taken as important and as necessary as essential is kind of being flipped on its head right now and we're kind of in this um in this place or opportunity or space to be able to really reflect on yeah if i okay so the question that was asked to me by somebody and it kind of stuck me for a second is if you knew this was going to happen and you could be anywhere, where would you be? Like, and not just physically, which for me was a big thing because I kind of had to leave London, but also emotionally and with the people and with your kind of heart space and brain space, are you doing the things in your life or are you creating a day-to-day life where you can have the things that you value up at the front, right? And not pushed away in, uh, in the back burner. So I think that this is also just a real, like a pretty big invitation for us to flip maybe what we, how we started and how we, what led us. I think we talked a bit about like, is it fear that's leading us today? Is it fear and this idea of scarcity for me to have to take toilet paper and pasta and all the things? Mm -hmm. Or, or is it the fact that I'm one person living on my own? I don't need 19 rolls of toilet paper, but maybe my neighbor does with a family of six people and really kind of reframe how we are operating in the world. And, uh, but you know what, the, the core bit of what you're talking about is choice. Mm. And we still have choice. Right. And, and whilst those decisions might seem to be, you know, the decision about you not taking so much loo roll to help someone else out doesn't seem like it's a big thing. It is a big thing. Right. Because it's then leading, it's living your values. Right. Because you say, well, I, I understand that people have more needs than me. Mm. And, and so you are living that, that value of compassion or that value of understanding community mm-hmm. through something that, you know, you think, oh, well, that's just nothing. But it isn't nothing. Right. It, it's really important. And we're all making a series of small, little, meaningful decisions. Yeah. But they add up to something important. And I think what you said before about people feeling connected that can create the space for empathy and compassion is this is what it's coming down to for me is that my choice is my choice but it also affects there is it does affect my neighbor it does affect my family it does affect a stranger yeah um so really it always is come back it's coming back to this choice and connection choice and connection yeah and the fact that now you know we're all so interdependent we're also connected that this can be uh, an opportunity for us to maybe think about again like what choices we're making and the impacts it's having on our community on our ability to make authentic connections with people not just social media like connections or, yeah, yeah. or all that kind of world yeah I, I mean the other thing that has struck me really profoundly is our ability to change you know, and if you think um, about some of the kind of decisions about, oh, no, you couldn't do this. People would never go for that. Right. I'm kind of thinking about things in, in connection with climate change, actually. Right. Um, well, we couldn't possibly do this. We couldn't. Well, just look what the entire world has done. Mm-hmm. You know, 99 percent of the entire world has gone. OK, I'm going to fundamentally change pretty much every aspect of my life and we can do it so i you know the eternal optimist me but i kind of think that wow wow isn't this amazing and and for this to be wasted in terms of our understanding Mm -hmm. about how we can do things differently 
and how actually people do adapt and they get creative and they make it work for them and they find a new way of being that is still purposeful and it gives space for other things. I find that quite hopeful. <laughs> yeah, I you know, agree. Face of adversity, what do we stand for? Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the things that when, when we were thinking, when we were asking you to, to come and talk on this, one of the things I was trying to do is like to relate what you've been doing over the, the last years with working with athletes. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, I know you work with athletes who've been injured mm -hmm. and, you know, as, as somebody who's been hurt by my hurt playing sports, you know, the, the, as soon as you hurt yourself as an athlete, you feel isolated, right? Yeah. You feel self-pity and you feel, woe is me. And you feel like, well, this isn't happening to anybody else, even though three or four other guys around the, the league have broken their legs too. So right now we're all going through the, the same thing, but yet I, I get a sense, and this is trying to get through to somebody who might be watching this right now who might be feeling a lot of self-pity, like woe is me. So right. what kind of things, how do you work with those, those athletes to say, hey, this isn't, this isn't going to be forever. Um, here are some, some things to th not think of yourself as being in this pity position. Mm -hmm. So one of the key things that we look for is find the opportunities because they're always there. You know, um, I'm, I'm working with um, an elite sprinter at the moment. And so he was knocking on the, you know, Olympics. Olympics is gone. Okay, what do we do? I'm going, right, let's, let's find the opportunities to do this. So we're working on real bits of detail of his um, start. We're working on visualization of it. We're working on looking at other things, find, you know, find those small gains. Um, find a way to make this time count. And you have to ask yourself different questions. So if you kind of think, oh, well, it's not how I want it to be. Well, sure. You have to have right. acceptance to begin with. You, you, you can't move forward until you go, okay, this is how it's going to be. Now what? Now how do I make it work for myself? And that's true for long-term injured athletes, you know, particularly those that are out for months and months and months of rehab. Um, you have options. You, you always have choice. But sometimes you need hand-holding through that process because it can be overwhelming. You know, it can be like an emotional tsunami and you kind of don't quite know which way is up. And I think you know, many people might be feeling that at the moment. You know, right. it's, an, it's an emotional tsunami. Um, and people who are, you know, struggling because all of the things that they anchored to seem to have been taken away. Mm -hmm. And you have to then find your own resources, um, you know. But find joy. And listen, you know, I'm no techno genius. But I'm like, I've learned this skill, I've learned that. It's like, okay, cool. I'm coming out at the end of this with a whole load of new tech skills that I never had before because I never had the time to learn them. So now I have to learn them because to carry on working in a sense, I have to, I have to learn them. Right. But actually that's, that's purpose, isn't it? And that's, yeah, I've achieved that. Good. It's interesting, this attachment, again, it, like the theme of attachment to whether, like whether we're an athlete and this is the path I'm gonna take and I'm very attached to the outcome of that specific past. It seems that, that our level of attachment and our relationship with how we're seeing ourselves in our future is the one thing that can get in the way of us maybe seeing opportunities that are right there, but we're just, focused on what we want it to be based on what the environment or circumstances were at that time. Yeah, and, and I think combined with that is the notion of being attached to, <coughs> excuse me, of how it's supposed to look. Right. It looks like this. I go and train at the track every day. Right. Okay, you can't. Oh my God, then I'm nothing. <laughs> then I can't do anything. Mm. Well, no, that's not true. H how do you do it differently? So um uh, the greatest thing about humans is their adaptability make it work change what right. you do uh, but you have to ask different questions 
and and you have to say to yourself you, you know some of the things i'm talking about with the players is okay create purpose and meaning and structure in your day so get up you know a lot of them are teenage boys so getting up it's like, oh, i don't have to get up anymore my friend's like mm, no 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, have to do the basics well right. because also we know that when those things start to unravel particularly if you're feeling very vulnerable you know maybe you're feeling very isolated maybe you're feeling lonely maybe you're feeling a little depression you know but actually um, if you let those things slide then actually you are just opening the door mm. and welcoming in more of those difficult thoughts and feelings um you know, we are designed to live in the sunshine. We are not designed to get up at three in the morning and then, you know, three in the afternoon and stay up till right. three in the morning. Right. That's not how we work. So find ways to do the basics well and then ask yourself, okay, what is my purpose for today? Mm. And then think, at the end of the day, you feel like you've achieved something. Right. In, in that movement, that what you're saying, it, it's that movement from that self-pity to gratitude, isn't it? Where you can actually, gratitude being placed in a position of being thankful that we don't have the virus, that we do have food, that we do have toilet paper. But then I've always found that if I'm in a place of gratitude, it always, it always enables me to be, to be able to return the gratitude in some way. Because you're open, aren't you? Hmm. you? You're kind of open. And, and I think it's about savoring the small stuff you know i mean i'm, I'm lucky my my daughter's here with me and she, she, she's not working because her job closed down she has no money she you know but i'm going well it's quite nice to see her you know <laughs> and so actually that time for me is is really precious really precious um and and actually you know i will I will look back on this time as being challenging, but also full of some really lovely, lovely time spent with her. So I appreciate that I'm lucky. And for you guys, you know, it's harder for you because you're, you're on your own. Um, but finding those ways of, of, of savoring moments of loveliness, whether it's, I don't know, I just cooked myself the most delicious pasta in the world and, and, I've never cooked pasta that's so delicious. I'm you know, getting a, in a different space. Do you know what I mean? It's like yeah. those moments matter. Mel's, Mel's think... in touch with her, her, her family. I'm by okay, myself. Okay, you're with your family. I'm grateful, okay. I'm grateful that I can wear sweatpants. Yay! <laughs> We're all living in sweatpants, mate. You know, that's, that's, yeah, cool. that's the new thing now. That's yeah. the new normal. Business attire is now stretchy pants. Yeah. Um, but I, I also think if I wasn't being, well, I'm grateful because I, um, you know, my brother was able to take me in and we're in a small yeah. condo in like the middle of downtown and it's fine, but it, it's small, but it's not because my God, my family came and, and really was able yeah. to embrace me and get space for me. Um, but also like along the lines is that if somebody maybe this is just the, the worker in me here is that if somebody doesn't have access or has like. A difficult relationship with food and this time can be a little bit heightened in sure. terms of how they prepare there's also i always say well there's nature right there's a walk you can take yep. and to hear a bird sing yep. is really just as powerful as have cooking a meal for yourself or learning a new skill because maybe people are not in that space yet they haven't come to that level right well, if, but if there we is access at, yeah if we look at the well-being you know kind of well-being bingo i.e. <laughs> all of the best things about well-being, going for a walk, being in nature, um, you know, they're right up there in terms of helping our well-being. And mm -hmm. the joy for me in London is, oh my God, I can actually hear the birds sing. Right. <laughs> yeah. And it's quiet and the air is actually nice to breathe. Mm. So I'll be grateful for that. You know, yeah. It is very, very different in London. I don't know, Nick, if you've been walking and found that. Yeah, it's been absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Um, I know, and I you hear stories from even around the world that um, that you know the dolphins are swimming up the canals in Venice, and you know I saw so somebody post the other day um, they live in either Cardiff or Bristol, and like all the seagulls had gone, and because they've had to go work because they actually <sighs> yeah. out they have to go and fish 
because they're not getting free chips from people. Um, <laughs> so, you know, like I, nature, Mother Earth is rehealing. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I think, like you said, staying optimistic about the fact that do we have to get back into that rat race yes. 45 hour week? Do right. I really run down the road to get the 730 train into town? Right. Yeah. And, and I think this is now where I can go up optimistically, staying optimistic about the future is that I have the tools and I have the evidence that I can go on with a change for yeah. the better. And, um, and I think it's, it's going to be important for people to be able to reinforce that and not come out of this when we start into fear of, I got to get back into that to earn right. the money. And I think that's going to be the important balance that we need to try to try to help people with. Yeah. And hopefully employers will maybe trust their employees a little bit more, mm. you know, because there is a kind of, um, <clears throat> A stigma, or well, not a stigma, no, that's not the right word. There's an assumption, isn't it, that you're working at home. Well, actually, <laughs> people work really well at home. I, 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 I work a lot at home. You work at home, yeah. It's <laughs> actually, a lot of the time, if I, if I go to the university to do certain, I can't think there, I can't write there, I can't be creative there. Um, so maybe people will actually, you know, when they say, yeah, I am actually working at home, that they will trust them more, maybe. Um, and that some of those um, those journeys become less necessary because we realize that actually takes such a toll on our bodies and our lives. And actually to be able to reconnect with a, a healthier body, mm -hmm. so a really important thing. It's also this idea of just sustainability. I mean, with the environment itself or herself, and then with our work and our, our relationships with our family, I mean, this is also the chance for us to say like, um, how do we, what do we, what structures do we put into place to create a more sustainable uh, environment so that the earth, when she's on pause or shuts down or closes for a bit, she's having a chance to heal, but maybe yeah. we don't have to go through this every so often. Maybe yeah, we yeah. can use this as a baseline to figure out what's working, not only for us as humans, but for our relationship with our, with nature essentially yeah. too, right? And that, and that's, that's, I guess the optimism, isn't it? That you, you like <laughs> to think that we don't automatically just rush back and go, oh, it's got to be the same again. Thank goodness right. it's the same. Hmm, not sure the same was working that well for everyone, right. quite frankly. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. But kind of got us here, didn't it? Well, sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's the, the kind of staying optimistic thing, the, the move from self-pity to one of gratitude. But the, the getting creative thing, now this is what I'm interested in. And what does the... You know, there are certain things that we can do in terms of setting goals, but what does getting creative do for, for one's self well being? So it's about being able to solve problems. So the problem that goes, okay, I don't know, let me talk about it in simple terms. I can't go to the gym. I need to train. Oh, I know, I've got a sports bag. I'll fill it up with something, or I've got some water that's heavy. I can use that. You know, we solve problems to get to where you want to go to. Um, the creativity also engages different sides of our brains that maybe we haven't been using in a while. Um, and, and getting creative, I, I think sometimes people think, oh, creative means drawing or... I don't know, you know, the creative arts, but it, it doesn't. It just means look at things differently. Ask different questions, find different answers, you know. Um, and again, all of human invention is because people looked at a problem from a different angle and thought, I wonder if, right. um, but there's, but we, we've all got that ability in us. We might not have used it in a while, but it is there. Mm -hmm. Nick? You're up. Oh, oh well, I, I was just thinking about what we've talked in our workshop last, I guess it was last week, is just what lens, the idea of, or the question of what lens are you looking through today? And so maybe if you're feeling a bit foggy or you're repeating the same kind of, or you're seeing the same image, maybe it's a chance for you to change the lens. And it might be one of gratitude, one from anxiety, just change the lens. And maybe it's one of gratitude or 
maybe it's one of compassion rather than um, self pity, right? It's, yeah. it's always kind of stopping that thought that's happening or that automatic reaction to more of a like conscious response in terms of how am I going to choose to uh, navigate this new experience that's coming up. And I think we also talked about the idea of seeing it as a plot twist in a movie of your life. No, and maybe you, you didn't see it coming, but it came. And so instead of seeing it as like this barrier, it's more of like, oh shit, oh shit. Um, maybe this is a, maybe this is gonna make the story better. Yeah, I like but that. I, right? Yeah, and yeah, I, yeah really that, that gives, yeah, that gives us a bit of a, of a chance to be curious, which is, yeah. I think, a theme that we can all connect with. Like, can we just be curious about, about ourselves, about our relationships that are forming, about what the world might look like? So instead of being anxious around it, how can we shift that lens to curiosity? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's a big kind of piece, too, that's important to remind people. It's like, you can be anxious, sure. Of course, we all are on some level, but we can also be curious about about where we're at and where we're going, right? Well, I think curiosity is the foundation for creativity. You can't you can't get creative right. unless you've been curious in the first place. Yeah. You know? So uh, yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right. Yeah, like asking different questions. Asking different questions, exactly. Rather than, I think, the people who are having the hardest time with this journey are the people who are struggling and wanting it to get back to normal. When is it going to be like this? Da, 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 da. And they're just so caught up in that narrative that they can't see beyond that. The people who are navigating through this really well are going, okay, I'm going to accept it. Mm -hmm. And how am I going to make it work for me? And let me be curious and let me see what I can learn about myself or see what I can learn about whatever it is, new bits of my job or maybe creating you know an entirely new kind of life yeah and it can be as simple as continuing to get up at eight o'clock and yeah. or changing the time you get up I'm gonna see what I'm like when I get up at seven yeah instead of eight right it's like as simple sure. as that sometimes too at least for me because I, str <laughs> I struggle with that but <laughs> it's 9 30 a.m for me I would just like to say. um no but that's something that you can make really small changes and to your point earlier of, of it doesn't have to be this huge kind of big capital C change it yep. can just simply be a small act of, or just a thought a different thought or a different time we wake up or a different ingredient we put in our pasta like it can be that but I think the thing is is about and then we have to notice right that's the key yeah and then we go oh what did that feel like right actually 7.30 is the perfect time for me to get up. I tried seven, felt like this. Tried eight, felt like that. Maybe, you know. Right, right, right. But, but that notion of um, doing small experiments. Mm -hmm. And let me try this. Let me, let me see what happens with curiosity, but with openness. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's the kind of um, place where new things happen. Creativity happens. Um, what I'm curious about is how humanity, like I think it's Carl, Carl Jung talked about unconscious connection. And I'm, I'm interested about how, you know, even through technology, even the fact that we're, you know, we might be isolated in a, in a room somewhere around the world, how we're becoming interconnected through these talks, you know, where people are becoming more aware of our connectedness, not just to our neighbors, or our location, but humanity as a whole. Mm -hmm. Now, when you talk about being optimistic, that's where I am, is that you know, this could be a global shift to, to becoming connected on a more uh, global, global basis where, where we could start becoming more compassionate for one another. Yep, that, I mean, there has to be some good change that comes from this. Uh, there has to be. There, there has to be, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we have to find ways, well, we have to, we have to ask different questions. I think that's the thing, you know, if they, they say to us tomorrow, okay, lockdown's finish. And then we all go back to living exactly the same way we have learned as, as a human species, we've learned nothing. Right. You know, and 
so to ask ourselves well what were the wins here what felt good what did we learn what did we learn about ourselves what did we learn about how we live our lives what did we learn about the fact that actually gosh it's walking in London and you can actually hear the birds and breathe in air that's so important you know I'm, I'm not looking forward to the smog coming back right so I don't know. It, it is interesting. It's interesting to think about, you know, tens of thousands of years of evolution, you know, and this is one of the, the, the cornerstones of how Retribe was set up. It was about becoming tribal again, mm -hmm. you know, and how, um, how this is kind of being that leveler to, for us to start relying on, on each other as human beings. Yeah. And going back to kind of our core instincts of like, you know, compassion and usefulness to others yeah. rather than to toilet the paper for me you know I live by myself right. I've got a good shower I don't need it you yeah. know um yeah, yeah. so yeah which is which is all the messages that we've been you know receiving for so long it's like just worry about you just do right. you do you do you um you know what's the most important thing that you get richer you get this you get right. stuff stuff mm. you know maybe people will press a pause on the stuff right we vacuously fill our lives with even in terms of our mental health and our mental well-being when we have a purpose when we have connection when we have a sense of belonging to things people outside of ourselves that automatically reduces maybe the internal dialogue yeah. of the anxiety of the loneliness of the depression because it's not just us living in um our kind of framework of us and it's me against the world or I mean around those kind of narratives where we could think our, our pain is just our pain and although the experience is yours it's something we do all connect with on on some level right we we all can understand what it's like to yeah. feel that and can also help each other exactly you know but we 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 don't we we bury it we hide away we pretend we're all fine right. you know we we smile and take selfies right. we pretend you know the veneer the veneer of life is um is very thin and right. you know and there are certain things that propagate that and, and so you know is it most important for a 14 year old kid to think about how they look on in a selfie right and they they how much effort is put into that which is meaningless really <laughs> right. compared to a connection with I don't know a sibling or a friend or mm. something meaningful and sustainable um, Absolutely. so it, we've 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 gone off down a down a bit of a weird path I think maybe that's just me and I'm old and I'm kind of going oh no, I, don't I, I, I don't understand I, it but uh, I, I I worry about it a little bit I guess yeah. yeah. If, if influencer culture could change out of this, I'd be a happy man. You know, and we can, instead of being influenced by by images that we see on an app, we can be influenced by our neighbor in, in being yeah. helpful with one another. Again, human connection. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm hoping that this is going to be us bringing us going local again and becoming part of a community again. Yeah. Um, Mel, do you have one more one more question? We're wrapping up. I actually did, and I completely lost it in that moment. Oh, okay. Well, it's gone. <laughs> um i have no idea go take it nick i lost oh, it um so um dr jervis just thank you so much for coming on if you have any kind thank of parting moments on on staying optimistic and getting creative do you have a final word no just wake up and have a think about how you can do that every day it'll make the journey easier amazing Very thank nice. you so much yeah. thank you so much it's so nice chatting thank you it was lovely talking to you both Thanks, Elephant and Castle community. If anybody has any questions, please get in touch through the Facebook group uh, message. And, um, and if you have any questions for, for Dr. Jervis or Melissa, um, please get in touch. And we'll see you next Tuesday. Well, we'll see you this Thursday for the workshop and next Tuesday for another talk. Thanks again, everybody. Oh, have thank a wonderful you. Day. Bye. Bye. Bye.